Hey everybody, um, we have just the tiniest little bit to do in chapter 9, it's very easy, and then we're going to jump into chapter 11. All right, so we're on chapter 9, and um, recall that 10 was all about epoxides, which was a really cool thing, and, and something you're going to see over and over until the end of Organic 2. But um, number 11 is a very small topic, and it just deals with a, a couple uh, functional groups. Thiols, sulfides, and disulfides, in very minimal uh, detail. So we're just going to talk briefly about them, and like where they're found, and you know, where you're going to see them again and stuff. So what's a thiol, what's a sulfide, what's a disulfide? A thiol is, a, is kind of like an alcohol, but it's with sulfur, RSH. A sulfide is RSR, right? So that's kind of like an alcohol, that's kind of like an ether, right? And then what's a disulfide? RSSR. So those are pretty, just, you know, in principle, the functional groups are pretty easy to understand. So, very briefly, again, we're, we're just going to talk about the... the, the crucial things you should know about these. Conceptually, what do you know about sulfur? And maybe organic sulfur. Um, first thing is they are stinky. They often smell kind of skunky or, I don't know, you know, onions have a lot of sulfur containing compounds and, you, you know, sort of the onion smell, but uh, skunks also have thiols that kind of give sk the skunky smell that we're familiar with. Um, what about also about sulfur that you've kind of seen, like maybe in chapter 6? Like we've seen, you know, examples of SN2 reactions and things like that. Sulfur is highly nucleophilic. So sulfur molecules, mo mostly thiols, we'll say, but, but you know, there's, there's cases where the sulfur and the thiol, or, or I mean, sulfide or disulfide can be nucleophilic. It's really going to be thiols, especially if you take the proton off, right? If it's RS minus. So we've seen that they're highly nucleophilic. Another thing is they're prone to oxidation. That's a unique behavior to sulfur. So sulfur can be oxidized. We'll show just a couple examples. Um, Okay, so that's kind of it, you know, it conceptually. Uh, what about, um, how can you make a sulfide? That's actually, it's very easy to make a sulfide. Just like how do you make an ether? You make an ether, like if it's ROR, through the Williamson ether synthesis, right? Like if you had an alcohol, if you had an alcohol and react with an alkyl halide, you could make an ether. Just like if you have a thiol and you react with an alkyl halide, you can make a sulfide. So it's... So that's uh, kind of how you can make a sulfide. You already know this. You've seen this a thousand times. Sulfides made by SN2. All right. And you and the th uh, remember that that's called a thiol. What's it called if it's RS minus? If it's RSH, it's thiol. RS minus is called thiolate. which is R, S, minus, all right? So, yeah, that, that's what a thiolate is, and, and that's how you do, that's how you can make a um, sulfide. It's like, for example, take a thiol, maybe react with NaH, which is our super good base, and then like an alkyl halide, maybe a little DMF or something, and then you get out a sulfide. So thiol reacts with base, ba base takes off the proton, make a thiolate, S minus, attacks the carbon, kicks off the Br, and you get a sulfide. Alright, um, and about, a little bit about disulfides. So disulfides are made not from SN2, but from oxidation. Of thiols. So, just in very simple terms, if I have a thiol, no, no mechanisms or anything, and I want to convert it 
Well, actually, there, sorry, there, there's, there's two things to know about thiols. First is that if you have a thiol, you can oxidize it to a higher oxidation state called a sulfonic acid, which is just S with a bunch of oxygens, right? So multiple oxidations here. And you, you need a kind of a strong oxidizing agent like KMNO4. KMNO4 is a very strong oxidizing agent, and it'll do this crazy multi-step oxidation. But if you want a gentle oxidation, you can actually oxidize a thiol to a disulfide. And you can it can go both ways. So if I use a mild oxidizing agent, I can go from thiol to disulfide. If I have a, a, a mild or you know the correct reducing agent, I can go from the disulfide back to the thiol. And uh, the mild oxidizing agent is I2, iodine. And the mild reducing agent is lithium, ammonia. Okay, no mechanisms or anything, but and you're probably not even going to see these on the quizzes or anywhere. But this is uh, just you know a little bit of the kind of chemistry that can occur between you know between thiol. This is called a sulfonic acid. Sulfonic acid. And this is called, of course, thiol and disulfide. Okay. I'll, the, uh, one other thing, very briefly, uh, where where will you see disulfides uh, a lot? Disulfides um, are important in protein structure, uh, structure. Protein structure. So you might have a if there's a protein. And it has thiols, which are the amino acid cysteine. Cysteine. So these thiols are in cysteine, which is one of the amino acids. Cysteine. They can be oxidized to the disulfides. Why would that might be cool in a protein structure? Is it could rigidifies it. So the, this is a more rigid structure because now you have a covalent interaction between two sulfurs, right? So this is a disulfide, and, and di so disulfides are found very frequently in protein structure to kind of hold them together. Okay. All right. That's it for th uh, sulfur-containing functional groups for now. All right. In chapter nine, and we're on to chapter eleven. All right, everybody. So we're into chapter um, eleven now, which is uh, kind of the conceptual details of alkenes, and um, most of the things are pretty simple. There's a couple, couple slightly more challenging things, but we decided to do this in PowerPoint because I think it's maybe the easiest. We're going to start with the naming of alkenes and the uh, kind of the properties and bonding and structure of alkenes. They're, they're not that complicated. Physical properties like boiling point and things like that. Um, there are some topics, NMR, IR, and mass spec. We're not skipping these. And, oh, sorry, we are skipping these, actually. And uh, these NMR is a huge topic in Organic 2. We're not going to really talk about it in Organic 1. Um, okay, let's see. And then degrees of unsaturation is pretty important. So we're going to review this and kind of learn about it a little bit. Catalytic hydrogenation is a really simple reaction where you just add H2 to alkenes to make alkanes. And then w from there, we're going to talk briefly about the E2 reaction and the E1 reaction just a little bit more. You, you already know about the E2, right? It makes alkenes and E1. And there's, there's a little bit to know once we learn about alkene stability, the stability of different kinds of alkenes, which is kind of what's in number nine there, right? OK, so naming. This is pretty straightforward based on what you already know about naming. All right, so general formula of alkenes is CnH2n, which is the same as a cycloalkane. 
as a you know um, as opposed to a, a normal alkane, which would be like CnH2n plus two, right? Like like hexane or butane or something. Um, so two hydrogens are lost when you have an alkene, and an example is pentene, which is C5H10, right? Five carbons, one, two, three, four, five, and it's ten hydrogens, right? Cyclopentane is also C5H10. One methyl cyclobutane is also C5H10. So if you have a ring or a double bond, it's kind of like you have a reduction of two hydrogen atoms, right? Okay, so versus CnH2n plus 2 for a normal alkane like pentane. So the common names replace a the ane at the end with a y-l-e-n-e -E, or just e-n-e. -E. Well, actually, uh, we'll see both actually, but I think common the common naming will usually be y-l-e-n-e. Couple of examples of common uh, simple alkenes are ethylene. Ethylene is two carbon alkene. Propylene, which is a three carbon alkene. Uh, trichloroethylene is a is a dry cleaning solvent, for example, and that's just ethylene with three chlorines on it. All right, these are common names, and we'll we'll talk about systematic naming in a second. And you know, we we uh, we emphasize systematic naming a little bit more. So, systematic or IUPAC naming. Um, we're going to convert the ANE into an ENE. All right, so the first rule is to find the longest chain that includes both carbons of the double bond. All right, so first find the longest chain that includes both carbons of the double bond. So in this case, it, it's, you know, the, the, the main chain is on the bottom here, one, two, three, four, five, it's a methylpentene. And, and we'll see the, the uh, naming will probably be like three methylpentene. Okay, in this case, um, we also find the longest chain that contains the alkene. So it's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, which is a propyl octene. It's, like an, it's right because we want the longest chain that contains both alkenes, both carbons of the alkene. So it's not a hexene derivative or a no-name derivative, which would you know be alternate ways to count through these, it's going to be an octene, propyl octene. All right, and then here, uh, you know, longest chain with the alkene is a decene, 10 carbons. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. All right. So it's not a pentene or heptene derivative or, or octene derivative, which are other ways you could count through these. You're going for the, for the main chain that contains both carbons of the alkene. All right, real, rule number two is uh, number starting at the end of the chain closest to the double bond and um, noting where the alkene begins. All right, so in this case, we number from left to right because the alkene begins on carbon number one. So this would be um, molecule would be called one one butene. One butene. It's a terminal alkene. It's not three butene, which would be the alternate numbering, right? Okay, what about this? Well, this one's pretty easy because if you number from left to right or right to left, it's the same thing. It's two butene. And this is called an internal alkene. So we have terminal alkenes in the end, internal alkenes kind of in the middle. Hmm, what about this? What do you think? Five carbons, it says pentene, and where's the alkene? What atom uh, is it on? It's two, two pentene. Okay, it's not three pentene, which would be the other numbering. What do you think this is? S uh, it's a cyclohexane, but there's an alkene in it. It's just called cyclohexane. Now, you don't have to define the numbering here because it, it, the numbering would be meaningless. Cyclohexene is cyclohexene, right? Okay, and, but, you know, we'll look at more complicated cyclohexenes in a bit. Um, in this case is just called cyclohexene, but if, if we have substituents, the numbering is going to be one and two on the 
cyclohexene. Okay, so alkenes with the same molecular formula but differing alkene uh, position are called alkene isomers. So if the alkene is in a different place, it's called an alkene isomer. All right, and as we saw, there's terminal alkenes and there's internal alkenes. Those are two types of alkenes. So terminal means it's at the end, internal means it's somewhere in the middle. Okay, so moving forward with naming. Um, if we have substituents, we add them into the name uh, and their position numbers. Um, if the alkene is asymmetric, meaning it has like you know different left and right sides, we begin from the end that gives the uh, first substituent with the lowest possible number. Okay, let's see an example of that. All right, so how would we name this? Kind of beginning, you know, from the ignore the methyl. Start with the, ignore the methyl, right? First, you say ah, it's how many carbons? Five carbons, right, on the main chain. So it's something pentene. It'd be you know, one pentene, something, right? One pentene, something, one pentene. And where's the methyl? It's on carbon carbon number three. So it's three methyl, one pentene. All right. Why do you have to say one for the pentene? Because that implies where the alkene is. And if you don't have the one, it doesn't tell you know. There's there's no uh, evidence of where the alkene is. Okay, all right. So in this case, this is a this is what we we're talking about. Um, uh, if you, if the alkene is kind of in the middle of the molecule, and we have to figure out which numbering to to use, um, the the first substituent will be like a tiebreaker. So we'd rather call this maybe two methyl three hexene. Right, it's three hexene, and it's two methyl. Not like if you number the other way, it'd be one, two, three, four, five, five methyl. Okay, so it's going to be two methyl, three hexene, two methyl, three hexene. Not, and that's obvious. I think that's, you know, that probably seems like a pretty obvious naming system that this would be two methyl, three hexene, and not the other way. All right, so this is a case where we have a uh, cyclohexene. So if you ignore the methyl, it's just cyclohexene, right? But now that we actually have the uh, a methyl on it, for example, um, the number, the naming of this would be three methyl cyclohexene, three methyl cyclohexene. And you still, the the funny thing is, you don't have to define like three methyl one cyclohexene because the one still has no meaning except for, you know, in the structure, one has a meaning, but the name, it's not necessary. So this is just 3-methylcyclohexene. It's definitely not 6-methylcyclohexene, which would be if you number the other way. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. All right? And you don't have to say 3-methyl-1-cyclohexene, because in this case, the 1 would have no meaning. In this case, the 1 does have meaning, right? Because it's, you know, where is the alkene, right? So that's funny though, you don't really need to specify the number of the cyclohexene here. Okay, next, identify the alkene geometry as cis or trans. Now this, this is if you have, a st have stereochemistry. Not all alkenes have stereochemistry. What do you mean by that? Okay, so this is a butene, right? It's simply a butene, one, two, three, four. It's, it's, it's butene, but there's a stereochemistry which is the the position of these two methyls, okay? And if the methyls are on the same side, we call it cis, cis. Okay, what do you think the methyl, it'll be called if the methyls are on the opposite side? You may have heard it before, but it's going to be called trans. This is called cis-2-butene. This is called trans-2-butene, all right? So if it's di these are disubstituted alkenes. What, is, what does disubstituted mean? Disubstituted, it means the alkene has two things on it, these two methyls, right? And you can either be a cis disubstituted alkene or you could be a trans disubstituted alkene. These are simple, right? And it's going to get a little more complicated, but for, for molecules like this, um, 
you know, cis and trans makes a lot of sense. And it just defines the relative orientation, relative orientation of the uh, things, the, the methyls in this case. All right, what about this? All right, so how are we going to name this molecule? Um, start from the end closest to the alkene, which looks like it's going to be the right side. One, two, three, four, five. Where's the chlorine? It's on one, two, three, four. So it's going to be four chloro, two pentene, right? Because there's it's two pentene based on the alkene. It's four chloro, one, two, three, four chloro, two pentene. And what's the stereochemistry of this alkene? Is it cis or trans? Hmm. What do you think? Ah, it matches the cis. Same relative orientation. So yeah. 4-chloro, 2-pentene, and it's, we number from the right, and of course it's cis, 4-chloro, 2-pentene. The, the book calls these diastereomers, which are stereoisomers that are not mirror images. I don't like this use of, of diastereomers. You know, we, we talk about stereoisomer, or diastereomers in chapter 5, where, um, you know, we think about like two chiral centers and things that aren't in antimers. I don't really like this use of diastereomers, but if you if you're reading along in the book, they're they're going to call these kind of things diastereomers as well. It's just uh, it's a different definition of diastereomers. Okay. Um. All right. So small cycloalkenes are always going to be cis. What do we mean by that? Small cycloalkene like four carbons, five carbons, six carbons. If you have a, a, an alkene in it, the ring is going to be built in a kind of cis manner. Okay. Now, large cycloalkenes can be trans. So if you have a larger ring, you can imagine a trans stereochemistry. So like this, this would be trans, right? Like this carbon and this carbon are opposite. All right. Okay, so then we have slightly more complicated system situation, and this is going to be called the easy system. It's very easy, um, where cis and trans labels are not sufficient. All right, so cis and trans works great if it's a disubstituted alkene, right? Like two butene. What if you have a more complicated alkene? All right, so this we're going to use this thing called the easy system. This is kind of reminiscent of the RS. Remember RS for chirality? So easy and RS are going to be kind of similar. And I'm yeah, okay. All right, so prioritize the alkene substituents using con ingold prelog. Remember that? As that was what you used for RS. We had like four priority. You know, like we have A, B, C, and D on a on a chiral carbon, right? Prioritize the alkene substituents. All right, so my trick, though, is going to be I'm going to prioritize one side of the alkene, and I'm going to prioritize the other side of the alkene separately. So if, and I'll, we'll show an example, so just hang, hang in there a sec. If the highest priority are on the same side of the alkene, we're going to call it Z. And the mnemonic I remember is Zemzide, like, you know, horrible German accent, like that, that same side, all right? If the things are on the same side, it's going to be called Z. If they're going to be on the opposite sides, we're going to be call them E, which is, I remember as anti, like the opposite, anti, all right? Anti, all right? So we have same side and we have anti, all right? So this, let's look at this molecule. Um, what I want to do is, is I usually grab my hand and I, I put it, I'm trying to, I can't show it to you, but I'm going to cover the right side of the molecule. Just cover all that on the right side. And look at the left side. All right? Cover the right side, look at the left. And then figure out who's the higher priority between bromine and fluorine. And you're using the, the Conningold prelog is just the, the prioritization we used for chirality, right? Atomic number, right? Bromine, high atomic number. Fluorine, small, smaller atomic number. So what I'm basically doing is I'm just looking at the right side, the, sorry, the left side first, left side first. Cover up the right side with my hand, cover it up, all right? And I see bromine wins over fluorine, right? Now I cover the left side up. So I cover up the other side and I say, hmm, fluorine and hydrogen, who wins? Fluorine, atomic number, right? Okay, 
This is all you have to do. Now you see that these are on the same side or the same side. All right. So this is going to be Z. This molecule is going to be called Z. All right. So how are we going to name it then? How are we going to name this molecule? We know it's Z something. Z blah blah blah. Z Z Z Z. Right. Okay, so it's ethylene. Two carbons is ethylene. And we're pro we have two substituents on the left, one on the right. So it's probably going to be one bromo, one bromo, one two difluoro, one bromo, one two difluoro, ethene. One bromo, one two difluoro, ethene. Right? Two carbons. It's ethene. One bromo, one two difluoro, ethene. One bromo, 1,2-difluoroethene. And Z, what does Z mean? Same side, or same side, okay? Why don't we just say cis or trans here? Well, you can't because it's not, a, it's more complicated than we can represent with cis and trans, right? All right, there's no cis and trans here because there's three substituents. It's a tri-substituted alkene. All right, let's think about this example. All right, so let's figure out E and Z for E and Z first. So I'm going to look at the left side. So I, I, what I do is get my hand out and cover out the cover up the right side, or you know, piece of paper, whatever you want. Cover up the right side of the alkene, which is like cover up all of this stuff on the right. Now we look at the the left. I'm like, hmm, methyl versus hydrogen. Who wins? Methyl versus hydrogen. Who wins? Well, uh, it's going to be the methyl, right? The methyl is going to win. Then I look at the other side, and I'm like, hmm, methyl versus isopropyl. Who's going to win? Isopropyl is going to win, right? Now I look and I see, uh, well, th th they're on opposite sides. The high priority is on opposite sides. Is it going to be E, Z, same side, or E and T? It's going to be E, right? All right, so then let's, so it's going to be E something. Now let's do the name. Uh, figure out the, the numbering is here one, two, three, four, five, longest chain with the alkene. Substituents, it looks like we have a uh, 3 comma 4 dimethyl. 3 comma 4 dimethyl, 2 pentene. 3 comma 4 dimethyl, 2 pentene. 3 4 dimethyl, 2 pentene. And is it E or Z? We said it's E. 3 4 dimethyl, 2 pentene. All right, there we go. That's the naming system. It's kind of like RNS, but easier easier get it all right another example so find the longest chain and decide a numbering system so let's see what do you think are we going to number kind of left to right or right to left well we see uh one two three four five six seven and the alkene would be kind of closer right one two three heptene it's a three heptene or is it would be a one two three four heptene one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Three heptene or four heptene? What do you think? It should be three heptene, right? Okay, so there's 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 the numbering system. It's gonna be a three heptene, and now we, we have numbering. We you know, we're working our way through this name. It's gonna be a three heptene, it looks like we have methyls on three and four and a chlorine on number one. So maybe one chloro, three, four dimethyl. One chloro, three, four dimethyl, right? One chloro, three, four dimethyl, three heptene is what I got. One chloro, three, four dimethyl, three heptene. And is it E or Z? So, what do you think? We cover up the right side, pretend the right side doesn't exist, and then I'm just looking at the left side. I'm like, hmm, methyl or two carbons and chlorine? Who's going to win? Ah, the two carbons and chlorine is probably going to win, right? Look on the other side. Cover up the left side now with your hand or paper. Cover up the left side. Now I'm thinking methyl versus propyl. Who's going to win? Ah, propyl. Okay. So I would maybe I would maybe you know with my highlighter or pencil I'd circle this and I'd circle this and I'm like all right that's E right that's an E one chloro three four dimethyl three heptene. Okay, and there's a slight twist. If you have an alcohol somewhere in the molecule, it wins the numbering competition over an alkene. So the numbering starts closer to the alcohol. All right. So alcohols containing alkenes are called X alkene Y all, which is a horrible thing that's kind of hard to memorize. But on the exam, I would give you the name and say draw the molecule so it makes it easier. 
it's not like you have to memorize this. I think I I would have trouble memorizing this, and I don't. It's not something I actually memorize. Okay, so meaning that if I have a this molecule, I don't number from the left. I actually number from the right. Okay, it's going to be and the the naming. What do you think? X alkene Y all. It looks like it's going to be two propene, two propene, one all, two propene, one all. That's the formula. Two propene, one all, not one propene, three all. All right, so in this case, this is a cyclohexenol, right? And the numbering starts at the alcohol. It's just a rule. I don't make the rules. I just, you know, I teach them because it's <laughs> it was designed this way 150 years ago. Um, anyway, so the, the way you'd number this is one, two, three, four. What do you think the name is? It's going to be one cyclohexene, one cyclohexene. Sorry, 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 sorry. It's, no, let's step back, sorry. It's three, so we use this formula, three cyclohexene, one all. Three cyclohexene, one all. Three cyclohexene, one all. That's the, and also the, the alkene doesn't have that extra E at the end, but again, I'm not gonna quiz you on that, so. What's, what I would most likely do is give you a name and say draw the structure, and that's uh, should be pretty easy. I, I would argue that if I give you these two names, you could probably figure out the structure, right? All right. On the exam, I give you the name, you draw the molecule. All right. One more complicated example. So this this molecule. How are we going to do this? What do we start? What do we what do we do first? We we find the chain that contains the alcohol and the alkene. And we number closest to the alcohol. So it looks like it's one, two, three, four, five, six, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And it looks like it might be four. One, two, three, four, five, six. So it's going to be hexene, uh, uh, so all, so hexene something all, right? Hexene something all. So maybe it's one, two, three, four hexene. 2-all, 4-hexene, 2-all. That's the end of the name, right? It's going to be 4-hexene, 2-all, 4-hexene, 2-all, all right? 4-hexene, 2-all, 4-hexene, 2-all. Now we just have to figure out the substituents. We have a ethyl on 3 and a chlorine on 5. 5-chloro, five. 3-ethyl, five 4-hexene, 2-all. And is this E or Z? So we look at the left side of the alkene. I'm like, oh yeah, chlorine wins over methyl, right? Chlorine wins over the methyl. And we look at the right side of the alkene. I'm like, hmm, hydrogen or this crazy thing? Hydrogen or crazy thing? What do you think? The crazy thing wins. So it looks like they're on the same side. So Z, Z five chloro three ethyl four hexene two all. All right. So remember uh, on the quiz, I'm not going to have you do what I just did on on these kind of alcohol alkene problems because they're kind of tough, but I might give you the name and ask you to draw the structure, which is actually pretty easy, right? Okay, structure and bonding of ethene and the physical properties of alkenes. All right, so back a little bit to atomic uh, structure and bonding. Um, so a double bond consists of two bonds, right? A double bond consists of two bonds. One bond's a sigma bond, one bond's a pi bond. All right? And this is kind of what it looks like, um, you know, at the electron level. So we have the two carbons. We have the sigma bond, is like the, what I call the single bond, and then the pi bond's the second bond, right? And the double, the second bond's a pi bond, a pi bond, a pair of electrons, right? It is roughly planar, so it's trigonal planar. The things are roughly 120 degrees. So the carbon to the hydrogen to the other hydrogen, that's 120 degrees. And you know, it's kind of not, not tetrahedral like sp3. Okay, so it's roughly 120 all around. And then the bond is a little closer than a normal bond because you have two bonds. Don't worry about numbers. Hybridization is sp2. Hybridization is sp2. Um, and so we have, you know, of course we have a total of three p orbitals. The remaining unhybridized p orbital is what causes the pi bond. So it's a, you know, you're going to have two of these uh, p 
orbitals and they have an electron each and the, together you form a, a pi bond which is uh, a pair of electrons. It's a double bond. Okay? It's an, it basically exists as an electron cloud ab above and below the bond. Okay, so the overlap of the sigma bond is much greater, so that's the strong bond, and then the pi bond is kind of the weak one, and that's the one that is more reactive. So the pi bond is, is the one that's going to do reactions of alkenes. It's relatively weak. So this is a little bit just showing kind of the uh, molecular orbital theory of the, uh, the sigma bond. So the sigma bond, is what it's showing is, um, there's a sigma and a sigma star. The sigma star is the antibonding. Don't worry about. You're not gonna have to. You're not gonna see this on the quiz. Just giving you little bits of information about the structure of these things, right? You have a bonding orbital and an antibonding orbital, all right? And then the pi bond. So this is sigma bond on the left, pi bond on the right. The pi bond looks the same way, but the energy is a little higher. And so that's this is the more reactive. Uh, uh, higher energy, kind of less stable bond. So that this bond is more likely to react. Okay, but it also has a um, pair of electrons in a bonding orbital and an antibonding orbital, right? So overall, there's four orbitals. Sigma, pi, sigma star, pi star, okay? So the sigma bond contributes more to the strength than does the pi bond. All right, so it kind of looks like this. This is the overall energy diagram. Sigma, pi, pi star, sigma star. And the pi electrons are the more likely ones to react. Um, this is interesting. Uh, some alkenes are more stable than others. And it's not that surprising, right? Not sur that surprising that some alkenes might be more stable. So like, for example, um, uh, if I consider, this is like de deuterium, right, the he heavier isotope of hydrogen. This is a cis, right? This is a cis stereochemistry. Which do you think is more stable, cis or trans? What do you think? Hmm, the two things close to each other or the two things that far apart? Yeah, I don't know. What do you think? Far apart, more stable, right? They, they want to be far apart. They want to be far apart, all right? And so anyway, if you cook this at a high temperature, it will isomerize through a transition state where it just rotates and becomes this. And this is a little more stable, right? Trans is a little more stable. Active energy is roughly the strength of the pi bond because you're breaking the pi bond. You have to apply energy to get through this, right? And it totally makes sense that if you apply energy, it might go from a less stable form to a more stable form. All right. We'll talk more about alkene stability in a little bit. Boiling points are similar to alkanes. There's not the boiling points are roughly the same, but cis are slightly higher boiling point than trans. Cis are slightly higher boiling point than trans. Why is that? Because they have a dipole. You have a cis where two things are pointing the same direction, it makes a dipole. And is a slight increased boiling point. You might see this on the quiz. I might show cis and trans and say which is the higher boiling point and cis will be slightly higher. So why there's the di dipole? Because there's uh, there's uh, more s orbital character in an sp2 hybridized atom compared to sp3. All right, the sp2 atoms are slightly electronegative, and they cause a dipole, a slight dipole. So in trans, the bi dipoles are canceled, and there's less of a boiling point effect. This just shows it really easily. Here's cis, all right? So I was talking about sp3 and sp2, right? So sp3 has a little more s character, sp2 has a little less s character, and that thus the, the sp2 is sucking electrons towards it a little bit, okay? And you have two of these effects, and the boiling point's four, okay? What if you have trans? Well, then the effect cancels out, and there, there's less of a boiling point. All right, so there's no net bi dipole. All right, bottom line, cis has a little bit of a dipole and a little bit of a boiling point increase because you have a little bit more of a intermolecular interaction. Okay, cis has slightly higher boiling point than trans. Here's dichloroethylene, 
same exact thing. The only difference here is chlorine is actually electronegative. And so the, 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 the little arrows, they, they kind of suggest the, the direction of the dipole and where the electrons are kind of being drawn towards. In chlorine, they're being drawn towards the chlorines, right? In this molecule on the right, it's towards the chlorines, 60 degrees. What do you think is going to happen with trans 1,2-dichloroethylene? Is it going to be higher or lower? What do you think? Say it. <laughs> Just kidding. It's video. So I can't hear you say it, but it should be not as high, right? It'll be a little bit less. 48, right? So there's no net dipole. It's canceled out. Okay, so electron attracting character SP2 also ac accounts for slightly increased acidity. Okay, so when SP2 if you compare the acidity to sp3, it's, it's going to be slightly more acidic because that you have more s character, more s character. All right, so if I consider butane, butane pK is 50, which is like very non-acidic. This uh, butene is about 44, so it's a little more acidic, and that's due to, you know, when we ever we think about acidity, what do we say? We talk about the stability of the conjugate base. So this is a very unstable conjugate base. This is a more stable, slightly more stable conjugate base, and that accounts for the slight, more slight, increased acidity. SP2 stabilizes the negative charge better. There's more S orbital character, and therefore the pK, parent pK is slightly lower. What we're going to see in organic two is when we think about alkynes. An alkyne is like a triple bond. Alkynes a triple bond, right? It's sp, and it's even going to be more acidic because it's sp. It's more s character. So alkynes, get ready for it. It's actually pK twenty. It's very, very, very acidic. Okay, these three topics are next chapter, next uh, semester. Actually, I'm sorry. All right, um, they're in the book. You can skip them if you're reading along in the book, which you should be doing. NMR, IR, and mass spec. Okay, degrees of unsaturation and catalytic hydrogenation. All right, so these are pretty important. Pretty poor important. Maybe we should have a little stars or, you know. Uh, you will see these, uh, certainly degrees of unsaturation until the very end of organic two. So get really good at this, degree of, of unsaturation. Okay, degree of unsaturation is defined as the number of rings um, and or, it's actually and or, pi bonds present in a molecule. It's useful information when we determine the structure of a compound. Okay, what do we mean by that? So these are just some molecules and the degrees of unsaturation. This doesn't have a, no double bonds, no rings, right? So it's zero. What about a molecule with one double bond or a molecule with one ring? It is one. What about a molecule with two double bonds, a ring and a one double bond or like two rings? What do you think? That's two. What about a molecule with three double bonds or a ring and two double bonds or two rings and one double bond? That's three, okay? That's the basic meaning of it. Degrees of unsaturation is the number of rings or double bonds in the molecule, all right? So fully saturated will have two N plus two hydrogen atoms, right? We already said that. So like hexane is two N plus two hydrogen atoms. Um, consider compounds in C5H8. So this is four hydrogens short of being saturated. Four hydrogens short of being saturated, right? Because if it was saturated, it would be C5H12, right? C5H12, all right? Um, so we're going to show this. I'm going to give you a really cool formula in a second. So I, I, I have my own special formula that I, I always use that's really cool to figure out degrees of untaturation. But for now, let's just consider these molecules in C5H8. So what structures could possibly have this formula? It's five carbons, and there's four hydrogens short of being saturated, right? So what do you think? Four hydrogens would be two double bonds or a ring and one double bond. So two double bonds is one option. A ring and one double bond, a ring and one double bond, a ring and one double bond, or like two rings, right? All of these would satisfy C5H8, okay? 
So I have my favorite way of calculating de degrees of unsaturation. If you have a printer, you might want to print this slide out. It's all, remember all the PowerPoints on the website too. It's all of this PowerPoint. There's a PDF file on the website. So my, my formula, the Mark formula, UN is equal to two times carbon minus H plus two all divided by two. It tells for any molecular formula, it tells you the UN degrees of unsaturation very quickly. But there's three rules. Before you do this formula, you got to consider these rules. Oxygen and sulfur, you just ignore. Just pretend they're not there. Oxygen and sulfur, you ignore. Halogens, you add a hydrogen before this, right? So if you say minus H, it's like minus H, you know, um, after we've like, you know, if we potentially add hydrogens, then this minus H is going to be a larger number, right? Okay. N. If we have nitrogen in the molecular formula, we subtract a hydrogen. So halogens we add, nitrogens we subtract, and that's all before we apply this formula. So this works every time I give you a molecular formula, all right? So you're going to see this all the way through organic too when we're, we're doing NMR and stuff also. All right, so a couple examples. So first of all, uh, this is just 2-butanol. Uh, um, let's just look. We know what's UN. It should be zero, right? There's no double bonds. Let's do the formula, d my formula. So oxygen, we, we ignore, and it says two times four, and then the plus two is, you know, we could do the plus two earlier. Now it's, it's just two, t two times four is eight, plus two is uh, 10 minus 10. 10 minus 10 is zero divided by two, and it is zero, right? Okay, so that's that's a simple example of my, my formula. What about this? I'm, see, again, I'm giving you the structure, so we know what UN should be just by looking at it. And then I give you the formula, and then you can um, uh, do the, you can confirm it, right? Okay, so what should it be? What, what should UN be, looking at the structure? Because if I give you the structure, it's really easy, right? <laughs> it's one, right? One, there's one double bond. So to do the formula, though, because um, remember, I'm not always going to give you the structure. On the exam, I'm not going to give you the structure. I'm going to give you formulas and say, what is the UN? And you have to calculate it. So let's pretend we don't have the structure. And we, we're like, all right, C6H11Cl. Um, all right, C6H11Cl. What do we do with Cl? We replace the 11 with 12, right? Uh, we add a hydrogen. So it's now it becomes C6H12, C6H12. Okay, so 2 times 6 plus 2 is 12, four, 14, 14 minus uh, 12, four, 14 minus 12 is 2, right? 14 minus 12 is 2. 2 divided by 2 is 1, right? So we, we got our unit equals 1, okay? All right, what about this crazy molecule, limonene? Well, let's f first, you know, given the structure, we can figure it out really easy, right? One, two, three. It should be three, right? One for the ring, two for a double bond, three for the other double bond. So it should be three. Let's see if our if our math works out. No oxygens or sulfurs or halogens. So we just do two times twelve. Two times twelve is twenty-four. I'm just gonna do the ad addition of the two right then. Twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty six, twenty-six minus twenty. 26 minus 20 is 6. 6 divided by 2 is 3. Okay, see what we're doing? All right, what about this? Camphor, that's weird. All right, so what, thinking about this, first of all, there's, there's two rings. There's the bottom ring, which is the six-member ring. We also have this little bridged ring. So that's going to be, there's w one, two, so there's basically two in the rings. And then what about the ketone? Well, that's also a double bond. The ketone's a, d a double bond also. So it is going to be um, three. The, the answer should be three. Let's see if it works. Oxygen we ignore. So ign just ignore the oxygen. That makes it easy, right? So 10 times 2 is 20, plus 2 is 22. 22 minus 16, I think, is 6. Yeah, six divided by two, six divided by two is three. So it should be three also, okay? 
ephedrine is a, a mild stimulant drug. Okay, and so benzene, whenever you see a benzene, what's the UN of benzene? Looking at the structure, what's the UN of benzene? Well, it's a ring and three double bonds. So a ring and three double bonds should be four, right? That's going to be four. Of course, this is expected to be zero because there's no double bonds. Okay, so let's, let's apply the formula. What do we do with nitrogen? Well, oxygen. What do we do with oxygen? We ignore it. So ignore the oxygen. But we have the nitrogen, and with the nitrogen, we subtract the hydrogen. So C10 becomes... So C10H15NO becomes what? C10H15NO becomes C10H14, right? This becomes C10H14 f in terms of the, the f formula. So is it uh, 2 times 10, 20, add the 2, 22. 22 minus 14. 22 minus 14 is 8. I think, yeah, 8. And what's 8 divided by 2? Should be 4, right? So that, again, a benzene is a ring and three double bonds, so it's 4. Okay. What about estrone, a steroid? Okay. Um, I'm not going to do the math for you, but let's just, l I'll let you do the math now. But let's just look at the structure. Benzene is 4. Here's a ring that's 5. Here's a ring that's 6. Here's a ring that's 7 and the ketone should be 8. See if you can get 8. See if you can get 8. If you can't get 8, you're not doing this right. And you have to figure this out with office hours or something. All right? Cool. Okay, catalytic hydrogenation and relative stability. Okay. So hydrogen gas, H2, in the presence of metal catalyst, usually palladium or platinum, adds to the alkene to generate an alkane. Okay? So, and that releases a little bit of heat. So a little bit of heat gets released, okay? Depending on the alkene, a little bit of heat gets released. So this is the basic reaction, right? Alkene plus H2 adds a pair of H's, and there's a little bit of heat released. What's the name of that heat that gets released? It's called the heat of hydrogenation, right? That's pretty straightforward. The heat of hydrogenation is a measure of alkene stability. And we're going to see that some alkenes are more stable than others. More energy released is a less stable alkene. Less energy released implies a more stable alkene, right? So more, if you release a bunch of energy, it's, less, it's not very stable. If you release very little energy, it's kind of more stable, right? So let's look at a couple numbers. One butene, that's just four carbons, alkene on number one. H2, that's the amount of energy release, negative 30.3 kilocalories per mole. We're, we usually deal with kilocalories per mole instead of kilojoules. But yeah, negative 30.3. Cis-2-butene is a little bit, is that more stable or less stable? So less energy is released. Less energy is released. It's a little more stable, OK, than 1-butene. That's interesting that an uh, internal alkene is going to be a little more stable than a terminal alkene. Trans is even less energy, OK? All right, so interestingly, it looks like if you look at these three, the trans is the most stable or the least stable? The least energy released, it's the most stable of these three. Something about being internal makes it more stable, OK? Less stable, more stable. What's this one? The mid sta middle stable. Okay. All right. So this figure just shows that kind of graphically. I know. I know these some figures are sometimes look a little scary, but it's nothing scary about this. What it's showing is all of those alkenes when they get hydrogenated, which just means converted to an alkane, they go to the same point, right? The same energy level. But which is the least stable, and which is the middle stable, and which is the most stable? It looks like the least stable is 1-butene, and the middle is cis, and then trans. Oh, you know, cis and trans make sense. Why would cis be a little less stable than trans? Because the methyls are bumping into each other vaguely, right? OK, so there's two factors to explain radical stability, uh, alkene stability. More substituted and more stable. 
and that's due to hyperconjugation. So as you add more things, this is a terminal one, like the neighboring things, and what do we say about the carbon and alkene? It's a slight electron withdrawing group, EWG, due to the S orbital character, right? So when we have one thing on the alkene, it has a little bit of stability, right? Because there's a complementary interaction. Monosubstituted is less stable. What if we have three things as a tri-substituted, for example? Now we have three things on the alkene, three things on the alkene, and they're all kind of con you know, donating electron density, and they are more stable. So the more things, usually CH3s and things like that, or carbons and CH2s, and the more things, the more substitution, the more stable. That's easy. Trans is more stable than cis. Why do you think that is? Steric clashing, it's just, you know, cis has a little bit of a steric clashing effect. So cis is a little less stable, trans is a little more stable. So that's pretty logical, okay? So putting this all together, putting this all together, and we, we can actually consider all the way from no substitution to tetra substitution. No substitution, we'll, we'll get to in a second no substitution, and then all the way to tetra. So let's just think about tetra. It's definitely the most stable, because you have four things on it, right? Who is a little less stable than tetra? Try, try substitute, right? Right, because you have the one less R group. All right, so we're gonna work our way from the right to the left. Tetra, most stable, most things. Try substituted, little bit um, less stable. Now we're going to have the cis and the trans, and who's more stable, cis or trans? Trans is a little more stable than cis, right? Trans is a little more stable than cis, right? Okay. Then we're going to have the next one is a little weird, but it's just it's going to be a, it's another di substituted. But it's like if the two R groups are right up next to each other, two R groups are right up to next to each other. It's a little less stable. Okay, and then. Who's less stable than a di substituted? These are all di substituted. Who's less stable than a di substituted? Mono substituted. And who's less stable than a mono substituted? Unsubstituted. Okay. All right. So th this you might want to print this out or you know s study this a little bit. It's not that crazy. I, I I can you know if you think about this, this is very easy, right? I I kind of memorize it in two pieces or you know, consider printing this out, it might be a useful study sheet. Um, but going from tetra-substituted to cis di substituted is pretty logical. And then you go to the other side, it's like, hmm, mo unsubstituted, monosubstituted, and then this is maybe the, the slightly weird one. Why is this kind of unstable compared to cis? It's because the two R groups are really next door to each other, and there's a, a steric clash, okay? So I, I um, if you're memorizing this, yeah, mo one one mono di substituted, sorry, one one di substituted is this one, is less stable than cis or trans because of sterics. All right. So one way to memorize it is consider just the three middle ones, right? Mem memorize this. Memorize the just these three. And then there. Furthermore, all other stability is by the number of R groups. So, who's more stable than di? Tri, who's more stable than tri? Tetra. Who's less stable than di? Mono. Who's less stable than mono? Unsubstituted. So that's another way to memorize this pretty easily. Okay, so E2 elimination. E2 elimination now. So now, now we, you know, what's that E2 elimination? It was making alkenes, remember that? How we made alkenes in chapter seven? But now we know more about alkenes and alkene stability, so we have to revise our discussion of E2. And we'll also have to dis revise our discussion of E1 a bit, okay? All right, so recall we know two ways of making alkenes by elimination processes. One was kind of uh, using base as the E2 reaction. What was the mechanism? It's just the super base grabs a proton, rips off the proton, and concerted reaction makes a double bond, kicks off the leaving group. So it's all like three arrows, right? Base takes proton, make the double bond, kick off leaving group. And that uh, makes an E2 reaction, right? 
And then the other is not base, but acid, and it's kind of the E1 type of reactions. And those, those is like a carbocation, right? Okay, you make a carbo a pronate al alcohol, falls off, make a carbocation, and yeah. Okay, so we have a new name. It's going to be called Zaitsev. Elimination reactions are generally predicted to form the most stabilized product. The most stabilized product. Okay, generally speaking, they make the most stable. Which, what does that mean? More substituted or less substituted? What's more stable? More substituted or less substituted? It's probably going to be substituted, more substituted. And those alkenes are going to be called Zaitsev. Okay, so if two or more constitutional isomers can be produced, they're, they're called regioisomers. So that means yeah, I could make potentially two different alkenes, and they're going to be called regioisomers. One where we make the double bond right there, one where we make the double bond right there. Okay? And who's going to be the more stable one? This is going to be the the more stable, the major one, the tri-substituted alkene with sodium methoxide. Who's the less stable? The alkene there. Why is that less stable? Because it's di-substituted, right? It's a di-substituted alkene. It's a tri-substituted alkene. So this one's called Zaitsev, and this is one called, what do you think? What's a good name? If this is Zaitsev, this is anti-Zaitsev. Anti-Zaitsev is the less substituted, okay? Less substituted alkene. Now, conversely, if we use a sterically hindered base, it actually leads to the anti zaitsev which is a little weird. Why would it do that? So a huge, huge, huge base, huge, huge, tributoxy, right? Huge. It has trouble sneaking in and grabbing that proton because it's kind of a hindered environment, right? So it doesn't want to grab this proton to make the happy Zaitsev product, it's going to go for the less sterically hindered proton. Beta, what does beta mean? Beta means next door, right? That's the alpha proton, that's the beta. We also have a beta there, right? Less sterically hindered beta proton. So is it going to actually go for the anti Zaitsev? That is kind of weird to you because you <laughs> haven't seen it before. L sterically hindered base makes anti Zaitsev. It's not going to make the Zaitsev, or if it does, it's going to be a major minor thing, you know. But this is definitely the major product because it has trouble. This even even though it's it's making the less stable alkene, right? But the reason is because it can e easier reach over to this proton. Okay, so this is simply due to sterics and the approach of the bulky base. The product is the less stable anti Zaitsev alkene. So the choice of the base has a major effect on the regiochemistry. What does regiochemistry mean again? It just means like in this case, you know, which alkene forms. Is it going to be Zaitsev or is it going to be anti-Zaitsev? The b choice of base has a major effect. So if I have this molecule, I can either do it with a sterically hindered base or a sterically non-hindered base. You should be able to draw the products here, right? What's the top one going to be? Is it going to be Zaitsev or anti Zaitsev? It's sterically hindered, so it's anti Zaitsev. And wh which beta proton is it? Is it going to be the, the left one next to the leaving group or the right one? It's probably going to be the right one, which will make a mono substituted alkene, right? Unhappy, unhappy mono substituted alkene. Now, whereas this one is going to, this doesn't have that restriction, so it's going to go for the left proton and it's going to make the Zaitsev. So you can fill in the products, I think. Also, if, if ever there's a mixture of cis and trans, it's probably going to make the trans. So in this case, this bottom one is probably not only is it going to make the Zaitsev alkene, it's going to make the trans Zaitsev alkene, not the cis Zaitsev alkene. Okay, and then E1 dehydration, like with a non-nucleophilic base, E1 is less controllable in terms of the regiochemical outcome. So it just always makes the most stable alkene. That's easy, <laughs> right? We like to not have exceptions. So E1 always makes Zaitsev. So in the dehydration of alcohols, the product is generally the most thermodynamically stable regioisomer. 
and it always would prefer trans versus cis. So, a couple examples. Top one, these are non-nucleophilic acids, and uh, yeah, it just makes a tri-substituted alkene. It doesn't make the zytsev, doesn't make the anti -zytsev. This one, same thing, and this, it could either go to the right or it could go to the left, but if it goes to the left, it's more stable. All right, uh, in addition, the, the, the alkene next to the benzene, there's some extra stability. We'll, uh, uh, we'll see that again in organic too. But this is a, called conjugated. There's like, these, two, these things are all kind of talking and it's a, a stabilizing interaction. Another one, uh, methyl cyclopentanol, sulfuric acid or phosphoric acid makes this, okay? Remember, sometimes these also cause carbocation rearrangements like we learned earlier in this chapter. Okay, that's the end of the PowerPoint of Chapter 11. Okay, so we're getting into Chapter 12 now, which is kind of the grand finale to Organic uh, 1. Um, it's a series of reactions of alkenes, and we're kind of putting together some of the knowledge we've learned before. Um, and there's a number of reactions, and we'll, we'll go through them, uh, you know, not, not in... Uh, tremendous detail, but we definitely need to talk about the, re uh, the mechanisms and, and kind of how they work and the reagents and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so the, the type of reaction we're going to see over and over is called an addition reaction. Addition reaction. So um, there's going to be a bunch of examples of addition reactions in this chapter. What do we mean by an addition reaction? Got an alkene. I react it with some kind of thing like AB and A goes on one atom, B goes on the other. So that kind of makes sense. And we actually learned one reaction already like this, which in the end of organic, sorry, end of chapter 11, alkenes would react with H2, right? H dash H, essentially, in the presence of palladium or platinum. Well, that's a catalyst, cat. And we'll talk about the role of that in a second. But essentially, one H goes on one side, one H goes on the other. So why does this happen? Why does addition proceed? Why does addition proceed or occur? Um, like, do you think, is this more stable or that more stable? Well, we know the double bond's kind of uns, or, well, it's the center of reactivity in an alkene. Um, and so, um, we're essentially trading a weak-ish, weak pi bond, right? It's kind of weak-ish, it's not a super strong bond. We're trading a, a, a weak pi bond for two strong sigma bonds. And that might make sense thermodynamically, right? So, for example, we already saw this. If we react uh, alkene with H2 in with a, like a palladium catalyst to make the hydrogenated product with HH there's a delta H value, right? And we, we saw that, and it's negative 30 kilocalories per mole. So it's exothermic. It's kind of a, a favored reaction, right? What we're also going to learn is like Br2 does the same thing. Br2. You don't need a catalyst for it. And what do you think the product is? Br2, what do you think? One Br goes on one side, one goes on the other. Positive number or negative number? It's negative, it's negative 29 kilocalories per mole also. So both of these are favored reactions. Uh, the calculation of this all is it was the delta H bonds uh, broken minus formed. Uh, we're not gonna do that and we don't care. You're not gonna have to do that on the quiz. But if you wanna read about that, it's uh, in section 12.1 um, of the book for like how is that's calculated because that is easily calculated okay all 
All right, so we're on to our first reaction of a series of fun reactions to learn in this chapter. The first one you already know a little bit about. It's catalytic hydrogenation. Catalytic hydrogenation. We learned about this in uh, the last chapter. All right. So, scene before. It's not the first time you've seen it. The big thing is it requires a catalyst. It's usually palladium or platinum or sometimes uh, platinum dioxide, PTO2, things like that. There's a metal catalyst that allows the reaction to proceed. Okay. So, without catalyst, no reaction. Just as an example, if I have like an alkene, we know that what should happen is you get H and H, right? But that if you, but if you don't have a catalyst, I'm not, I'm not writing a catalyst, NR without the catalyst, right? Without a catalyst, there's no reaction, all right? So, what does the catalyst do? So, well, the mechanism of this is pretty easy, so we're, we're going to show the mechanism and, and like, you know, what, what is the involvement of the catalyst. I'll just draw an alkene and I'll react it with H2 with a catalyst. So this is a real real reaction now. So yes, this will work and this is a nice happy reaction. So what does the catalyst do? I draw this a certain way. I, I draw the catalyst as like a little metal surface. So that's a little metal surface. And I am going to have H, H kind of underneath it. And I'm going to have the H2 kind of absorb onto the surface. So dot, 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 dot. All right, there we go. And essentially, two electrons go this way, two electrons go that way. And what happens to your metal surface now? Ah, you have H and H on it now, yeah? Okay, so now the al what happens now is the alkene just kind of grabs the H off the metal surface. So it's going to be, I think, three arrows now. Okay, so now I draw a dot 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 again. Kind of like that. So this grabs that H, this puts electrons back on the catalyst, and just a little circular process and you get that. Alright, so that's what the catalyst does, that's how the, the H's ultimately get transferred to the alkene, and that's essentially how catalytic hydrogenation works. It's really a pretty simple reaction, and we saw there's a little bit of delta H here, you know, if it's a if it's a stable alkene, it uh, produces less delta H. If it's a if it's an unstable alkene, it produces more delta H. But that's essentially it for catalytic hydrogenation. You know, we we learned a little bit about it already. Right. Okay, so we're just gonna start this reaction. This is a pretty easy one, also. And just to show you, you know, another reaction of alkenes. This is a relatively easy one. Number three, which is reaction electrophilic addition. Of halogen acids like HBr, HCl, HI, mostly those ones. All right. So I'm going to show the basic idea first. The basic idea of this reaction is very simple. Let's draw cyclohexene. We're going to react with like HX. 
net reaction, what do you think? One atom goes on one at one atom goes to one carbon, the other atom goes to the other carbon. So you get like HX. That's not that hard, right? Electrophilic addition of these acids. All right. Now the mechanism is actually really easy too. So a lot of these reactions in this chapter, you'll see that the the benzene can kind of act, sorry not benzene alkene can kind of act as a nucleophile, and so it's going to grab the proton. How easy is that? It just attacks. And what do you? What's that going to give you? H, right? And what's what's on this atom? Because two electrons got kicked out to make a bond to H, and then you're left over with a carbocation. Ah, what do you think X minus is going to do now? To finish up the reaction, it just attacks. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. It's just a you know, alkene grabs a proton, makes a carbocation, X attacks. Um, show a real example. Cyclopentene, HBr. And what's the product? H on one side, Br on the other. Sometimes we just draw it like like that. I mean, it's the same thing. We're just we're not we don't have to show the H, right? These are the same thing. So yeah, you're just adding a, a H on one atom and a Br on the other. All right. So what I'm going to close with is ju just um, a real quick mention of regiochemistry. Remember that regiochemistry? It's kind of like which side of the alkene it, these things might react on, and Let's just, what I'll do is just very quickly have this simple example, all right? This will be a simple example to demonstrate regiochemistry. Okay, so, uh, there's two possible products. There's going to be two possible products. The BR goes into the middle, or the BR goes onto the end. And so I'll draw those. Okay. All right. And the mechanism, of course. What's the mechanism of these? What happens? The al alkene does what to the HPR? It attacks it, right? So, jumping to the chase, this is the only one that's formed. Only. Only that one's formed. And and uh, of course, when the alkene attacks HPR, what do you make? It makes a what? What kind of? Species do you get? What was that called? Uh, something cation, right? Yeah, so if, if the alkene attacks the H, makes the Br, it's going to make a carbocation, right? And what did we know about carbocation stability? Like what kind of carbocations are more stable and less stable, right? The more substitution, the more stable, right? Like tertiary carbocation is the best. This is a secondary carbocation, right? So what's Br minus do? It just attacks. Because if this one formed, you'd have what kind of carbocation? What kind of carbocation is that? This is a secondary, that's a primary. So he's more stable. The secondary is more stable. So this one just doesn't happen, right? So this this does not happen at all. XXX. No, it does not happen, all right? Okay, so the last thing, I'm just going to give a name for this behavior. This this kind of regiochemistry we just drew, uh, we're going to call it, it has a name, just like, remember Zaitsev and anti-Zaitsev? Well, for this chapter, the, the name we're going to give is called Markovnikov. Markovnikov. The regiochemistry is called Markovnikov. So it's always when you when you have a alkene like with two different sides on it, it's always going to make the more the Br goes on the more stable or substituted position, the more substituted position. 
and we're going to call it the Markovnikov product with the BR in the more substitute position. This one would be called what? If the one that's not formed is called anti-Markovnikov, right? Markovnikov, anti-Markovnikov. And um, yeah, so this reaction overall, this electrophilic addition of HBr, HCl, HI is always going to be Markovnikov. Sometimes it's abbreviated Markov, like M A R K O V, right? Markovnikov. And the reason that's interesting is later we'll learn a way that actually makes anti Markovnikov. Okay, so for now though, all you know is Markovnikov. HBr, Markovnikov, HCl, HI, they all make the Markovnikov product. Okay, all right, cool. That's it for this lecture. We'll, we'll finish up next lecture and uh, yeah. Yeah, and if we if there's certain things we don't get to next lecture, we're going to have something called an extra lecture, which you won't have to know the mechanisms, but, but there, may, there may be a, a potential extra credit problem, and, you, know, and um, you will need to know all the reactions, uh, the reagents and stuff. You just won't need to know the mechanisms on this, this extra lecture, if we need it. We may not, we may not even need it. I'm uh, pretty hopeful we can just get through everything. All right.